Welcome, and thank you for taking the time to listen to this presentation. My name is Clay Lexon, and I'm an engineer with the City of Moorhead. This PowerPoint presentation is meant to serve as a source of information for the 30th Avenue South project that is proposed to take place this upcoming summer. Traditionally, the engineering department would hold in-person public information meetings. This year, that's not the case. We will be posting presentations like this for many of our street projects. In this presentation, I will give you a brief explanation of how the city selects its projects, how we decide which streets to do, and what kind of work we're going to be doing. I will also explain the kind of work we are proposing to do in your neighborhood. The purpose of these presentations is to provide the public with information about these projects and also provide an opportunity for residents and business owners to solicit feedback. You may be wondering how and why your street was chosen for improvements. The city uses a Pavement Condition Index, or PCI for short, and this allows us to create a value or a grade or a score as a representation of the condition of a certain road. The PCI is a numerical value with zero being the worst and 100 being the best. Zero would mean that there's no pavement left and 100 would essentially mean that it's brand new construction. Every roadway, every street within the city gets one of these values and we update these values yearly. The city hires a consultant to evaluate the condition of the road and we take that information and we feed it into our pavement management software and that helps us determine which projects we should do based on our budget for that year. For our street projects, we look five years ahead. Right now, if you go to the city's website, you can view our five-year CIP plan and see all the street improvement projects we are proposing to do for the next five years. So we use our pavement management software, which takes into consideration the PCI value and our proposed budget for each year, and we develop a five-year plan. It tells us which streets we should do and how to get the most out of our tax dollars. Before I go into more depth on the Pavement Condition Index, I'd like to explain the three major types of projects that we typically perform. These are what we refer to as a mill and overlay, a rehab, and a reconstruction. A mill and overlay is the simplest of the three types of projects. During a mill and overlay, we remove the top couple inches of pavement using a milling machine, and then we put down a couple inches of new bituminous or asphalt pavement. During these projects, we are also required by law to update sidewalk and pedestrian ramps at intersections to make them ADA compliant. We will replace certain sections of curb and gutter if it isn't draining or if it's significantly damaged or broken up. We will also make repairs to storm sewer inlets and manholes if needed. Again, it's important to note that a mill and overlay project is the most cost effective project we have. We get the most life out of our roads for the least amount of money. A mill and overlay will, on average, cost a little over $3 per square foot of roadway. The next type of project is what we call a rehab. This is where we will replace the entire pavement section, but we will leave the curb and gutter largely in place. We will do spot repairs on the curb and gutter and make the ADA updates and storm sewer improvements. This project is more involved than a mill and overlay, and on average costs a little more than $7 per square foot of roadway a little more than double what a mill and overlay costs. A reconstruction is where we will completely replace the pavement and the curb and gutter. This is the most complex type of project we will do and typically costs a little over $10 per square foot of roadway, more than three times what a mill and overlay will cost. From time to time, we have to perform maintenance on our streets to extend the life of the pavement. This maintenance can bring the PCI back up to an acceptable level. Typically, we shoot for an average value of right around 80. That's an acceptable level that provides a relatively comfortable ride. The chart on this slide shows how our construction and maintenance strategies change depending on the PCI value. On the top, you can see the PCI values going from 100 to 0, so from best to worst. And as you read from top to bottom, you can see our different strategies and how they change as the PCI gets lower. For the early years of pavement, we do minor maintenance such as crack sealing and seal coating or chip seals. When the PCI drops into the 70s, we start to look at more significant maintenance such as a mill and overlay in order to bring that value back up. A mill and overlay is where we will actually remove the top couple inches of pavement using a milling machine and then we will put back a couple inches of brand new bituminous or asphalt pavement. If the PCI is even lower and we don't think that a mill and overlay will be cost effective or that we won't get the life out of the pavement that we want, 
we will look at more extensive projects where we might replace the entire pavement section, which is called a rehab, or completely replace the pavement and the curb and gutter, which is called a reconstruction. Generally, the lower the PCI, the worst condition the road is in, and the more extensive and expensive the remedy is. On this slide is a graph that compares PCI versus time. The purpose of the graph is to show the value of maintenance, specifically of our mill and overlay projects. As I mentioned before, the mill and overlay type of project is the most cost-effective project type that we are able to do. If we are able to perform that type of project at critical points in the life of the road, we not only spend the least amount, but we can actually extend the life of the street by a number of years. The graph compares two scenarios, a street with maintenance and a street without maintenance. The blue line is a street with no mill and overlay maintenance performed on it. It starts at a PCI value of 100 and over time decreases. Once it hits 30, we would reconstruct the road, and this cycle is shown twice. The orange line represents a road that does have a mill and overlay maintenance performed on it. You can see a couple critical points on this graph. We would try to do a mill and overlay at those critical points, right around a PCI of 60. When we perform that work, the road is repaired and the PCI is increased back to 100. And you can see that this cycle is repeated twice. Eventually, a mill and overlay won't be effective and we would let the road decrease down to about 30, where we would then do a reconstruction. Across the bottom of the graph are several blue and orange arrows that represent the life cycles of the roads. These arrows are showing that a road with mill and overlay maintenance actually extends the life of the road, meaning that it's a longer period of time before we need to reconstruct it. Not only do we extend the life of the road, but based on the data that we have from past projects, we know that we will spend less money on maintaining our roads when we do it this way, and the condition of the road will be maintained at a higher level. The average PCI of a road with no maintenance is 68. The average PCI of a road with mill and overlay maintenance is 73. That just means it's a nicer road and a smoother ride. On this slide, we have the history and current conditions of 30th Avenue South and 14th Street South. There is a picture of a portion of the city's five-year CIP map on this slide, and you can see the project 21B circled at the bottom. That's 30th Avenue South and 14th Street South. So 30th Avenue South was constructed in 1972. There was a mill and overlay in 1981, but there hasn't been any major maintenance performed on the street since then. There may have been some minor maintenance items done by the street department, such as a chip seal or an overlay, but we don't have records of that. The average PCI for the stretch of the road is a 71, but there are some other significant issues regarding the, the road. The first is that the road and, and the curb and gutter is very flat, and that doesn't lend itself very well to good drainage. The other is that the curb and gutter is generally in poor condition. This road has actually been on the city's five-year CIP plan since 2005, but has been delayed repeatedly because of funding concerns. 14th Street South was constructed originally in 1974, and then the pavement section was replaced again in 2005, and there was a seal coat done on the street more recently in 2015. The average PCI for this street is a 74. It doesn't have quite the same problems that 30th Avenue South does, but there are places on this street that have no crown, or a slightly inverted crown, causing water to pool near the center of the road. And that's something that we would look to correct. The proposed improvements for 30th Avenue South include what we would call a reconstruction, meaning we are going to completely remove and replace the road. That means all new concrete pavement, all new curb and gutter, and new driveway approaches. We will also make updates to the sidewalks at intersections to make the pedestrian ramps ADA compliant. In addition, we will construct a 10-foot wide concrete bike path on the south side of 30th Avenue South from 14th Street to 20th Street. This is being done to connect existing portions of the city's trail system that are immediately to the east and west of the project area along 30th Avenue South. Lastly, we'll improve drainage by changing the grade of the road a little bit and by adding additional storm sewer inlets. The scope of work on 14th Street South is relatively simple and includes a mill and overlay, meaning we will remove and replace only the top couple inches of pavement. Along certain areas of the road, we will add a leveling course and reshape the crown of the road to improve drainage. On this slide, I've got some project-specific information for you. The anticipated start date for this project would be sometime in May or June. This is a large enough project that I'm expecting the contractor to want to get an early start. 
but it'll be dependent on the contractor schedule and it will be weather dependent as well. We will likely hold a pre-construction conference in April and at that meeting we will get a construction schedule from the contractor. We will know approximately when they want to start. At that time the city will send out notifications to all property owners along the project area to let you know when the approximate start date is as well. The completion date for this project is September 15th. That doesn't necessarily mean that 30th Avenue South will be in a state of construction from May to the middle of September. It just means that the contractor has that window of time to complete the project. The project will also be completed in phases and each phase will have a specific amount of time allotted for construction. In regard to the mill and overlay on 14th Street South, that work should not take very long, likely a week or two at the most. Maintaining business access is a priority for us during the project. We understand that you have employees and patrons and members of the public that are coming and going from your properties and we're going to maintain access for you throughout the duration of the project. Some of the ways we'll do that may include a temporary gravel curb crossing and a temporary driveway or we might use a temporary access road around construction. If you only have one driveway access to your property, we may ask that you work with a neighboring property so that you can access a side street through their parking area. We'll also be providing business signing at our detour locations so that the public will know how to get to you. If you have questions on how we'll maintain access to your property, please get in contact with me. My contact information will be provided at the end of this presentation. Lastly, we're anticipating that garbage and recycling pickup will continue as normal. When the city does projects like this, we typically get questions such as, well, how much does the project cost and where does the money come from to pay for it? We've estimated that this project will cost approximately $2.6 million. That includes all of the costs associated with the construction, as well as fees associated with financing the project. The funding on this project comes from two sources, special assessments and general obligation bonds. Special assessments on this project will come in two types, front footage assessments and area-wide assessments. Those assessments are expected to generate approximately $1 million towards the project. The remaining $1.6 million of the project will be funded through general obligation bonds that the city obtains on the open market. Those bonds are paid on through the city's general tax levy fund. By city policy, special assessments will be levied against the benefiting properties. As I mentioned before, there are two types of special assessments. The first is front footage assessments. Properties immediately adjacent to either 30th Avenue South or 14th Street South will receive a special assessment based on the type of work being performed on their street and based on the front footage of their property. For rectangular lots, front footage is determined as the width of the property abutting the street that is being improved. The second type is an area-wide assessment. By city policy, every property in the city is assigned a north-south collector street and a east-west collector street. 30th Avenue South and 14th Street South are both considered collector streets. Because these collector streets see higher volumes of traffic, they are designed to a higher standard, meaning they are more costly to construct, maintain, and replace. When improvements are made to these streets, the city levies an additional area-wide assessment to the properties to which the street has been assigned. On this project, there are two area-wide assessments, one for 30th Avenue South and one for 14th Street South. This map shows the assessment districts for this project. The dashed purple line is showing the limits of the work on 30th Avenue South, and the red line is showing the limits of the mill and overlay on 14th Street South. Properties immediately adjacent to either of those projects will receive a front footage assessment based on the rate for the type of work being done there. The yellow line is the boundary for the 14th Street area-wide assessment, and the blue line is the boundary for the area-wide assessment for 30th Avenue South. This slide includes information on the assessment rates. You'll notice that we have two categories, front footage special assessment rates and the area-wide assessment rate. As I mentioned before, the front footage assessment is levied against properties that are next to the road that has the project. The rate depends on the type of work being done there. If the city is doing a mill and overlay, it's $30 a front foot. If it's a rehab, it's $61 a front foot. If it's a reconstruction, it's $105 a, a front foot. And the focus for this project is on the mill and overlay rate, which would apply to 14th Street, and the reconstruction rate, which would apply to properties on 30th Avenue South. The area-wide is relatively simple. It's a flat $500 assessment for residential properties 
and for commercial properties it's $500 per quarter acre of property. And I'll go through a couple examples on the following slides. I'm going to go through several examples of how assessments are calculated. For this first example, we can take a commercial property that is 100 feet wide, is one acre in total lot size, and it's adjacent to 30th Avenue South, which is being reconstructed. The front footage assessment would be 100 feet multiplied by the front footage reconstruction rate, which is $105 per front foot, for a total of $10,500. This property would also receive an area-wide assessment. So it's a one acre lot, so $500 per quarter acre means that the area-wide assessments for the work on 30th Avenue would be $2,000. So the total assessment in this example would be $12,500. So for example two, let's consider a residential property. Let's say this property is on 14th Street South, which is the mill and overlay area, and that the property measures 60 feet wide. So the front footage assessment for this property, so we have 60 feet times $30 a front foot, which is the rate for a mill and overlay. So that assessment for the front footage would be $1,800. This property would also receive an area-wide assess assessment, which would be $500. So $1,800 plus 500 would have a total assessment of $2,300. For this last example, we'll consider a residential property that is not adjacent or, or next to either 14th Street South or 30th Avenue South. They're not within the project areas for either the mill and overlay or the reconstruction. For them, the, air, the only assessment they would receive would be an area-wide assessment, so a total of $500. They would not be receiving a front footage assessment because they're not adjacent to the work. In the previous slides, I went through several examples for determining assessments. Typically, those assessments would be added to the property taxes in January of the following year after the project. So it's 2021, we're proposing to do this project on 30th Avenue South and 14th Street South. And in the fall of 2021, you'll receive a notice from the city letting you know what those assessments would be. And then in January of 2022, the amount would be officially added to your property taxes. Typically, those assessment amounts would be paid over a period of 20 years, and the city uses a constant principal method for determining the assessment, and that's what's shown in the table on the right-hand side. Property owners should note that if they want, they will have the opportunity to pay part or all of the assessment amount before it's officially added to the property taxes. This allows the property owner to pay less interest or no interest if they were to choose to pay it all off. The table on the right hand side shows year 1 through year 20 and shows the starting assessment amount, the principal, the interest, and the total annual payment. In this example, it's an assessment amount of $5,000. You can see that the principal amount stays the same from year 1 through year 20, but that the interest amount decreases each year. And so the total annual payment as a part of your property taxes would also decrease. In this example, the annual amount in year 1 is $475 a year or roughly $40 a month, and in year 20, it would be about half of that at $261 a year or $22 a month. So this is the last slide for this presentation. I know I've gone through a lot of information, and for many of you, it may be the first time that you've heard some of this. So here's my contact information. If you have questions about the project, please feel free to reach out to me by email or by phone. If you have questions about construction access, or schedule or scope of work, please contact me. I'd be happy to speak with you or come out on site if you'd like that. One thing that I'd ask is that if you know that you have irrigation lines or sprinkler lines in the boulevard, that you let us know about that. We'll try to work with you to avoid those if we can. If we don't think that we can avoid it, we'd ask that they be removed prior to construction so that we don't damage them. Lastly, if you have questions specifically related to special assessments, please feel free to reach out to the city's special assessment coordinator, Amy Weagle. If you have questions about rates or amounts or how the whole process works, she'll be the one that you'll want to speak with. And if you made it this far in the presentation, I just want to thank you for sticking with me. Thank you very much for your time. And again, please feel free to reach out with any questions.